it's my screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and open with a description of patriarchy, give a short presentation. And uh, after that, Jackie Davino will speak. Anita Rios was scheduled to speak. She is not feeling well today. So uh, we're not sure if she's gonna be able to make it, but Alan Hunter, Aiden Hill, Laura Wells, and everyone here um, will have a discussion. Um, the idea is to, you know, what, what's really amazing about this entire thing is that it's such, a, it's such an important topic that members from every caucus have something to say on it. So I think that's an amazing thing and um, we'll hear from everyone. So with opening with uh, our description of patriarchy and its enablers. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm Dee Murphy. I don't, <laughs> I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dee Murphy, but I'm um, going back. Um, the description of patriarchy and its enablers. A uh, description of patriarchy and overview of the meaning of patriarchy, how patriarchal attitudes and those who enable them affects team cooperation and productivity in subtle and insidious ways, and how ignoring it or allowing it to remain unaddressed limits the potential of any group or organization to achieve effective goals and mission statements. Patriarchal, how this contributes to the oppression theme for the annual national meeting in 2021. Patriarchal attitudes and behavior delay, stagnate and oppress contributions from those who are deemed to be weaker in some fashion by its perpetrators and enablers, creating disharmony, dispiritedness, and a disengagement from the intended objects. By creating these impressions within the intended subjects and through implied acceptance of these behaviors by others involved in the organization, those who are subjected to patriarchal attitudes become oppressed and ultimately can lose their ability to contribute or participate within the limits of any organizational framework. So broadly, uh, the, the definition is controlled by men of a disproportionately large share of power, a society or institution organized according to the principles or practices of patriarchy. For, 20, for example, for 20 years, the country was ruled as a patriarchy. It's also defined as a social system in which power is held by men through cultural norms and customs that favor men and withhold opportunity from women. Patriarchy is a social system in which men hold primary power and predominate in roles of political leadership, moral authority, social privilege, and control of property. So uh, I saw an article that I thought was, I mean, this woman could have been speaking for me. Uh, her name is Shoshana Howard and she had published this in, the, uh, in an article called Women in the Workplace Facing Patriarchy Head On. And this applies not just to the Green Party, but to my previous work experiences in, in, in the past in, in different realms and different venues. Uh, one of the things she says, uh, I have some excerpts, and one of them is, let's just say it, getting fired is a swift hard kick to your ego, no matter how much you dislike the job. When I was terminated from a role in a nonprofit because of personality differences between me and the founder, I found myself questioning my worth, ability, skills, but mostly my personality and how others perceived me. Though I was committed to seeing my work through, even despite the personality contrasts, in a daily barrage of poorly executed management, I was willing to roll up my sleeves and work. That was until I was told my tone was too strong or that when I attempted to take leadership, I wasn't acting collaboratively. So when I was let go for being outspoken and questioning when I felt accountability was lacking, I found myself at odds. Should I have my mouth, should I have kept my mouth shut? Should I have said yes, sir, and followed the pack? Should I have been more soft? At this point, I figure that the only way to break free from the gender stereotypes, at least as much as possible, is to be my own boss and to work only with those who are inspired and driven by my ferocity. Notice wouldn't have happened if I had been a strong, if I hadn't been a strong and determined woman, ready and willing to put it all on the line, to refuse to be a subordinate in an environment where my critical thinking and willingness to ask the tough questions was seen as abrasive and unwelcome. Each day I remind myself that change, that the change must start within. To all the working women out there, you're not too strong, you're not too inconsiderate, 
or required to be soft and submissive. And if you are working for someone who expects that from you, I implore you to rise up, take a leap and forge your own path. I'll be right next to you the whole way. Okay, and then uh, next I have a quote, some quotes for, uh, from a, a male who gives advice on how to organ, uh, change patriarchy within an organization. His name is Drew Saras. Uh, I just got a few of his action points. And number one is to push for a culture of excellence to hold men and boys accountable for their language and actions where all people can make positive influences on the world. This means countering the boys will be boys idea. We shouldn't discount men and their ability to be upstanding individuals. We just have to keep high expectations. Action three is to reframe patriarchy as an issue for everyone, not just a women's issue. Since men should take responsibility for altering both themselves and challenging men around them. As Bell Hooks quote from the beginning of this post reminds us, patriarchy has no gender. Thus it's going to take all people to combat it. Action nine, train men and foster the attitude that men should be proactive in addressing patriarchy. Men need to challenge other men on their patriarchal and sexist ideas and actions. So it seems to me that this is a much better mentality to stand up to your friends and community in order to help make them more conscientious people. Uh, the lessons that I've learned, progress has been made over the years, but I do see an open reversal in our continued conversation regarding historically oppressed demographics in society. Newer generations think that male jog piling on women with strong voices is okay, in person and without. Another aspect of patriarchy, I wonder, this is going on physically as well as within the Green Party list serves internally. Uh, there's room for mutual respect and dialogue. Address the discussion topic, not the person. This does not need to be organized or co coordinated in secret groups meant to silence, oppress, or remove dissenting voices. And with that, I'll stop screen sharing. We do have some questions that you may consider later, but I'm assuming that there's going to be some chat. So we'll post the questions later after Jackie speaks and everyone else on the panel. Thank you. Jackie, you are amazingly up. I am amazingly up, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi all, my name is Jackie Devano. I, am, I live in Portland, Maine. I'm a 71 year old cis white female and have been in the Green Party since 2000. Everyone on this panel is going to address this issue from their perspective. I have been dealing with male dominance all my life with sadly some very life-changing effects. But I first want to make it clear that I'm not here to bash males for it is a system in the way we have taught and brought up our male children that is the, the crux of the matter. For starters, it has always been a fact that a male child was considered, excuse me, a fact that a male child was considered weak and or a sissy if they showed emotions other than anger. And when you've had to suppress those feelings into adulthood, it can be very damaging in many ways. And if anger is your male go-to reaction, then that is what you will see and feel. Of course, that's not the only damage to, male, to a male child, excuse me, a male child will deal with. Being taught that they are superior in even subtle ways is also an issue. I know myself growing up with two brothers that I was taught to do the dishes, wash, the, wash and iron the clothes, vacuum the house and many other chores while my brothers only had to take out the trash, and if they forgot, well, dad would do it. Now, I'm not saying that, that <clears throat> what I experienced was the norm, but it is but one example of what I'm expressing here. I am also not saying that these are excuses to feel sorry for males, but it is an underlying effect and why you go through life being given from a very, why they go through life 
being given from a very young age the tools and encouragement of a male dominated society. We know no other reality. And that's why I am sure that many males feel at this point when so many females have been awoken to their truths that women are unfairly bashing them. Though luckily for many, not all women have been awoken. How it plays out in the workplace and in organizations like the Green Party is of grave concern and consequences. Having been involved in the Green Party at local, state and national level, I've had to work hard to have my voice heard. Though those who know me <laughs> know I am one of the awoken ones that doesn't step back um, from their ta these challenges. I think that as a party that is trying to take us out of the corporate male dominated world that has us near the brink of extinction into a world of sustainability with equal rights for all living things with love and compassion, that it is going to be a woman, it is going to be the women of this party that are going to lead this charge. Much like it was and is in many indigenous cultures where they knew the wisdom and nurturing of the women to be their leaders. So it is very important that this party leads by example and finds ways to acknowledge and respect all genders with love and compassion. It is my hope that this workshop will start us on this course because we all deserve to live, work, and organize in a world filled with love and compassion and an understanding and to teach our young not only these things, but the earth teachings that our indigenous brothers and sisters grew up with. And we need and we need to be one with the same love and respect for the earth and all things living on it. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for such beautiful spirit and, and really heart-wrenching heart words that, that really resound on deep levels. Um, I think that Anita Rios would be next. And as we've stated, she's not really feeling well. Anita, did you make it? Yeah, she, she isn't feeling well and we send her our you know, heartfelt prayers that she feels better soon. We love you. Please get better soon, Anita. So next we have uh, Ellen Hunter who will present their piece uh, and their, from their perspectives and their background and their history and work with patriarchy. Hi, uh, my name is Alan Hunter. My own personal vantage point from which I've been assessing patriarchy throughout my life is that of a person with male morphology perceived to be male, perceived also to be femme, sissy, effeminate, to be manifesting characteristics that were associated with the girls. I don't tend to call myself transgender because if I do, I end up correcting people's assumptions. I am not a transitioner, medically or socially. I don't present as female. Instead, I'm in your face about having a sex and gender combination that's unexpected. I'm male, I'm girl, get used to it. Some people call it non-binary. I call it genderqueer. I'm a member of the Lavender Caucus. I consider myself an ally of my transgender sisters with whom I have obvious parameters in common and also of feminists whose indictment of gender norms as a central part of patriarchy were my first supportive social messages. The factors that led other kids to brand me as a sissy, as a boy who acted like a girl, were priorities and values, behaviors and personality traits. Over the years, as I tried to make sense of the world surrounding me, I came to think of our institutions, our social structures, as embodying personality traits the same way that people do. Because this is a patriarchy, the attitudes and values and priorities associated with masculinity are strongly written to our social structures, our ways of interacting and deciding things. When it comes to individual male people, 
Conformity to the set of masculine traits is eroticized. It's defined as sexy, as a necessary prerequisite for sexual experience. In the case of institutions, the association is more with the notion of success. That if you want to get things done, they have to be done this way. That to not do them this way means weakness and failure to meet your goals. The Green Party is not immune to this. In the years since I became a Green, many women have expressed concern that the ensconced masculine interactions did women away because they see discussion style that's all about winning the debate, not exploring what might or might not be a useful tactic or a good way to look at a social issue. Because they hear people arguing as adversaries where either I'm right and you're wrong or vice versa. Where confidence is so important that people feel pressured to pretend to a certainty they don't have. Where if you're wrong, you're also evil and therefore a political enemy. It's a type of thinking that urges us to believe that the ends justify the means. And that's the polar opposite of what feminists told us in the 1970s and 80s, that the process is as important as the content. Yes, we need structural change. Our politics does need to go beyond the level of, gee, you know, it would be nice if we could be nice to each other. And yes, anger is liberating and valid and energizing. And no, not every trait conventionally associated primarily with male people is useless or always destructive. But we can't coerce our way to an equitable world. We need to band together and unify and find our commonality, but this can be done with, by integrating individual experience and learning from one another instead of by blocking any departure from dogmatic truth. I don't mean to imply that we're no better than any other patriarchal institution. We have some good communication practices, we greens. We have the stack and the habit of calling on folks who haven't already spoken on the current topic. We prefer to call on women if the discussion thus far has been a male-centric conversation. There are also good practices that I've observed in other settings. My favorite is the practice of repeating back the viewpoint of what someone else said before dissenting with it, repeating it back in terms that reassure them that you actually heard and followed what they were saying. But you know, attitude is ultimately more important than any magic solutions. We can rise against oppression without centralizing a fight mentality. So Sonia Johnson once said, feminism, as the biophysic, biophilic philosophy and worldview that it is, has no place for the concept of enemy. Our refusal to hide behind a fortress of closed ears and closed minds can be one of our greatest assets. We have a positive, inclusive, optimistic vision, and we should go forth more to communicate with the people who do not yet share it, whether within the Green Party or outside, and not so much with the attitude of beating them and seeking to triumph over them. Thank you very, very much for your insight, Alan. Next, uh, we have Aiden Hill from the National Black Caucus, the Youth Caucus, and the Lavender Caucus. Thank you so much for that introduction. I want to echo what Dee said about patriarchy. I think those quotes, especially from Bell Hooks, was very essential to understanding what we're going through. But needless to say, my name is Aiden Hill. I use they, them pronouns. I'm legally non-binary, um, and I identify primarily as a woman. So I'm currently a student at UC Berkeley under political science. I am the former vice chair of the City of Berkeley's Homeless Commission, a constant Green Party candidate, and as well as a former candidate for city council. And my experience is primarily at the international level of governance, especially through the United Nations. But I do have federal uh, level of governance experience with Congress member Mark Takano, state level um, with uh, state Senator Nancy Skinner, local 
level of governance as well. And I am openly transgender and I use they, them pronouns. Um, so why is this important? Why is my voice necessary um, to this conversation? Well, according to PBS, on nearly every continent and for all of recorded history, thriving cultures have recognized, revered, and integrated more than two genders. Terms such as transgender and gay are strictly new constructs that assume three things. That one, there are only two sexes, which are male and female, as many as two sexualities, such as gay and straight, and only two genders, which are man and woman. However, hundreds of distinct societies around the globe have had traditions of third, fourth, fifth, or more genders. Um, the idea of two-spirited people, uh, for example, as well as in Hawaiian culture, there is a third gender that's revered and respected called mahu, those who embody both male and female spirits. And PBS states, most Western societies have no direct correlation for this tradition, nor for many other communities without strict either or concepts of sex, sexuality and gender. So with that said, um, why is this so important? Why do we need to understand that the distinction between the patriarchy's cis binary structure uh, versus the worldview or the respect for diversity of more than just two genders. Well, according to 2016 study from the Journal of Sex Research, one of the most common themes of discrimination for genderqueer people is the inc incorrect use of gender pronouns. It also labeled this as non-affirmation, and it occurs when people don't affirm another sense of gender identity. Some participants of this survey also uh, reported experiencing gender policing. Even more striking, in 2021 alone, 33 states have introduced more than 100 bills that aim to curb the rights of transgender people across the country. Advocacy groups consider this a record-breaking year for such legislation, and this legislation is geared more, mo uh, mostly towards minors. And likewise, a recent report by the Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual and Transgender Charity called Stonewall found that 80% of transgender youth have self-harm and 40% have attempted suicide. This is striking because the experiences of LGBTQIA people have constantly been uh, dismantled, marginalized, erased, and if not murdered through gender-based violence, throughout the entire course of colonization. Before that, many cultures understood that more than two genders existed at any given time. It was only until capitalism in which the male being defined to the warehouse and the woman uh, essentially being defined to the kitchen and child raising occurred. So the cis patriarchy or the idea that only men and women exist is a fundamental part of male domination within society. When I first ran for city council, I wrote an op-ed called Marriage Was Not Enough, Why I'm Still Proud. And to uh, give a quote from that op-ed, uh, I was accepted into UC Berkeley as a first generation transfer student and chose the Bay Area for sanctuary as a black, queer, trans, and person of color. Instead of rainbows, I received tuition hikes, unaffordable housing, and the threat of losing health co coverage. The university didn't save me, however. I became homeless and UC Berkeley charged me with a $17,000 debt for a period I couldn't complete. Locked out of resources, assaulted by a member of the staff of the college, suffering from complex PTSD because of these things and facing the off-campus housing requirement known as females only, I was denied continuing my study. This treatment is the reality for most black and indigenous people of color as well as sexual and gender minorities. We're treated as untouchables, forced into alleys, bathhouses, and closets just to feel safe or alive. Even cis women, our sisters, embolden the patriarchy by erasing our voices and narratives from sex workers from our history, reducing their own womanhood to the object of the male gaze. Despite third genders existing in Peru, Uganda, Italy, India, and across indigenous societies around the world, we are continually murdered, assaulted, and erased every single day. When I ran for mayor, my platform heavily centered around social equality and integration of rights within the city government. Some of these rights specifically were for women, including the rights of women, as well as ending violence against women. 
with my platform in place, uh, the idea of the rights of women that I hope to pass was adoption, adoption of a charter amendment guaranteeing the rights of women to freedom of violence, freedom from violence, freedom of choice, and freedom from coercive acts. I wish to pass legislation that required comparable pay for comparable work, expanding childcare within the workplace, and preventing gender-based job discrimination and sexual harassment. Likewise, I wanted to increase support and funding for safe houses and other domestic violence survival services. I wanted to support early screening and prevention training for families at high risk of violence and support for intervention and treatment for both survivors and perpetrators of domestic violence. I wanted to utilize mass media campaigns to educate the public on the presence and long-term as well as generational trauma of this domestic violence and really focus on family planners, as well as adequate health care for women and children, especially prenatal care. Throughout my time in the Green Party, I've always encouraged the pillar of feminism, which promotes the collaboration of ideas across a broad spectrum. And just like Alan stated, I really encourage people to uh, erase those divides, those hasty generalizations in which uh, men essentially feel, how do I put it? men feel entitled to spaces and it pushes women and other gender minorities to the background. I faced a fair share of discrimination within the Green Party and I hope this talk, uh, this presentation helps to change the culture of male violence and promote a future in which all of us can thrive together. Thank you. Eden, thank you for your wisdom and contributing from an alternative perspective on this topic. Um, next, we have Laura Wells, who is a member of the National Women's Caucus. Hey, my name is Laura Wells of the Green Party of California. I live in Oakland. I've been a Green since 1992, and I've run for office primarily state controller in California. My apologies for not turning on my video, but I've got a rash that won't quit and it's pretty scary. And so I don't wanna see it myself nor subject you to it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two things, women speaking and women running. I'm not gonna talk about women needing to do more of the organizational behind the scenes work because we already do a lot of that and it is a valuable contribution. But also our public voices and our presence in the electoral arena are desperately needed in these times for the values, for the perspective and for the power that comes from speaking out and with running for office. Now, power can be a great thing, but not patriarchal power, which is domination, power over rather than power with. Within patriarchy, unfortunately, the easiest way to show that you're powerful is to destroy, is to put down. The easiest way to demonstrate superiority is to criticize. And that includes criticizing colleagues and their ideas. Uh, and it's really unfortunate that harsh, critical words come so much more easily on the internet than face to face. So the power that we need that's not patriarchal, that we need women and men and every all genders to exert more in our struggle for a better world is the power to support good ideas and advance our good green values. That's a great power to exert. I heard a phrase once that was, be tough on the problem and easy on the people. Tough on the problem, easy on the people. So I wanna say that what I think is the main weapon of the 1% to keep the power and control in their hands and to keep the rest of us weak, whether it's the whole world or the Green Party of California, I think it's keep them busy. I'm starting to think that the famous uh, divide and conquer weapon is just a subset of keep them busy. Keep us busy fighting among each other um, and we won't be able to fight against the problems of the world. But examples of keeping us busy 
are not having good health care. And my rash is one of those examples. Um, having too little money and too much debt. Um, keep women busy taking care of everybody and everything. Keep black and brown people busy dealing with all kinds of injustice. So we're kept busy and I'm, and I'm so aware of when I'm not feeling well of how much energy that takes. And so when, the, when healthcare is not available for everybody, it's a huge drain on our ability to organize against the injustice and the problems of the world. Um, but in terms of, of being critical or, or, in solid, or in solidarity with our, our fellows, or <laughs> with our colleagues, there's a book I'm going to put in the chat, and it, but it's called Cancel This Book, The Progressive Case Against Cancel Culture. And that's where somebody whose contributions get canceled out because they did or said something stupid. Uh, okay, so what keeps women from speaking and running as much as men do in the Green Party? To me, that's a huge question. What keeps women from speaking and running as much as men do in the Green Party? So I have some advice um, in order to do what we can within the system that we've got and with the hope of changing it. Um, but first, and this is to every single green activist, whatever gender, consider doing Toastmasters. You'll find a grassroots member help member local club that will give you practice with both prepared and impromptu speaking, plus a chance to spread the word about the green values and, uh, it's, and it's fun. So second, there are a ton of reasons that we as women especially give ourselves not to speak out or not to run for office. So our job is to catch those reasons or excuses and see if this time we can push beyond them. I mean, it's a practice. Even though I think the women in this Zoom are probably the exception because we refuse to completely shut up or stay in our corners, but it is true in the Green Party, even for internal offices, at least in California, that it's harder to find women to run than it is to find men. And so there's something going on that's, that's big. I want to read something that when I asked some uh, some colleagues in California, if they might want to join the panel, here's what one woman said, and she she points out a lot of uh, reasons that come up why we don't necessarily run or speak on panels and things like that. She said, "We put enormous pressure on ourselves to do things perfectly because we have to be better than to be able to counter the attacks that come our way for being outspoken, confident." or unwilling to please people. Unless a woman is running on the right, then all she, you know, in the big wide world, then all she has to do is actually uphold the patriarchy to win. Anywhere center to left, we are expected to either model the patriarchy in the center or fight it with our every platform plank on the left for being perceived the weaker sex by a broad majority. We are expected at every turn to be the better sex or the backlash is extra brutal. And I think that's true. They say the fair sex, I think fair sex is fair game. Um, so, but whatever reasons come into your head or others, the primary practical advice is to practice as with anything and practice solidarity when we know that there are women that we're working with that have something to say that aren't saying it, you know, whatever we can do to encourage them to, um, to, to speak out, to run for office. I heard somebody say that it takes seven times that somebody needs to ask a woman to run for office and might only take one for somebody else. But so, so encourage women because we all need encouragement. It literally means things that give us heart. Um, because we've been pushed down and our voices and our perspectives are needed desperately in this world. And so in summary, consider Toastmasters, it's fun. Uh, notice and notice what stops us from keeping the contributions we can make. 
and watch out for things, make work kinds of things that keep us busy and not effective. Good luck to all of us. Thank you so very, very much for your wisdom and insight, Laura. And thank you for being the first person to volunteer when a request went out for speakers on this subject. Um, next, I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, there's a few questions that I'd like to put up to consider. Um, there are questions coming in and we, we will uh, each take about two minutes on the panel to address whatever questions are presented. I know that Kristen has shared a PowerPoint or a, a um, document with us. And, and right now I see one question on it. So mine might, may not be uploading, but um, I really would like to, I really want to think about this within our, our, within our party and we don't have to discuss this now. It's just something that, that maybe we can all consider um, when it comes to the topic of patriarchy and patriarchal behavior. The first one is, if you feel someone is threatening your position, both title-wise and in other aspects, such as levels of intelligence or public facing off, et cetera, what is the most emotionally intelligent approach that you can make? Two, if someone triggers something that you're passionate about in a way that you perceive to be averse to your position, how can we address this without necessarily taking discussions and opinions further and trying to dominate them everywhere we see them? Three, there is a difference between speaking in a strong voice on one topic or another and oppressing another person's point of view and perspective. How can we differentiate between what we perceive as personal attacks on a message that we care about and actual patriarchy? And with that, we will go to questions. Can any other member of the panel see our questions or I can exit out of here? Yeah, right now there is just the one question, D. Okay. But people feel free to send your questions. My name in the chat is send questions here. So feel free to send them to me. Okay, so we will um, take our turns at addressing, there's two now. And uh, at that point, we can maybe open up for comments, opinions, suggestions, ideas, perspectives. The first question is the seemingly permanent yoking of feminist values to neoliberal feminism in the United States is a source of permanent pain and anger to me. And this is submitted by someone who's participating in a workshop. Do you think this will ever change? After witnessing and experiencing scapegoating maltreatment and or just plain old fashioned shunning from both women and men professing feminism because I walked, on a walked out on the Democrats two plus decades ago and won't come home. I'm pretty, I've pretty much given up. Any thoughts or ideas? Thanks. So who would like to begin answering that? We, we have uh, allocated two minutes for each person to uh, respond to that question. Aiden, you look ready. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to give someone else a chance to speak, but I can definitely talk on that. Um, so I definitely hear the scapegoating and maltreatment. And I would say that that is simply a part of a cis patriarchal structure. The gearing towards violence and towards inflicting pain is something that at least I've perceived that men are inherently trained upon uh, to be stoic, to not express your feelings, to suffer their abuse from their older generations and inflict that onto others. It's really like a poison or even a virus that I see um, passed along to group to group because each person experiences that trauma, yet who's the one to heal it? Um, where are the trained professionals in social justice issues who understand trauma traumatic responses, who are willing to give their aid? These are things that can overcome that. But I also wanted to mention, I remember Gloria Steinem back in the 2016 election. Um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but she said something like, if you don't vote for Hillary, Hillary Clinton, there's a special place in hell for you, especially geared towards women. I think that's an aspect of, uh, 
trans-exclusionary radical feminism that I see that's prevalent within our societies is that if you hold someone who is acting in patriarchal ways on a platform, uh, in order to move the whole, we have to endorse them. I think there's a difference between that and supporting our own natural communities, our local communities, the indigenous people within our um, area of residence because the structure is completely different. Um, even though most indigenous communities, at least within California that I've seen are matrilineal. Um, so I think the difference of perspective and shifting that conversation away from power, domination and control into harmony with the environment and harmony with all other people and respect for life. I think that's something that can help in that situation. Thank you, Aiden. And I recall that it was Madeleine Albright, actually, who was our, I think she was our former Secretary of State, who had made that comment or, or in one of those positions, but it was Madeleine Albright. Because I remember seeing that and being so furious that she would say that because, you know, I'm not, I wasn't a supporter of the neoliberal Hillary Clinton movement. And so uh, to answer, and my, my answer to that question is also I feel like there's a lot of resource guarding and I feel that people feel that they need to protect their spaces in whichever way they can um, just to because everyone's advocating for their own interests in some fashion. Um, this topic being more on patriarchy than feminism. Um, you know, I really appreciate the voices of a lot of feminists who have, who have spoken against patriotism, uh, patriarchy in order to allow us all you know, an opportunity to have a, a space at the table. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely against, um, I'm, I'm not for taking on patriarchal attitudes and trying to do so and methods and means of communication, but that's all I'll say on that. Uh, Jackie, Ellen, Laura. Um, I could say something, I, one of the hopes I have actually for, as Aiden was talking about the, the non-binary um, move that's happening at long last, even in this country, is that uh, we're we're given two parties. We're we are there are there's an assumption that there are only two parties who can win, and one of the big weapons against the Green Party, even people who absolutely agree with our platform, it, and they think that the candidate may be a wonderful person and well presented and all of that stuff is that well they can't win so you can't vote for them um and so uh that that is partly where whether you know the the comment about you have to vote for biden you have to vote for hillary you have to vote for them is there, is that there are two choices period which is not true and so again just to say that's one of my hopes for the uh one of the basic binaries is male female and the more that that gets broken up, then I think we have a better chance to break up the binary of the two party system supposedly being all there is, over. Yes, and I'll, I'll, agree, I'll agree with Laura on that. Um, I think that as I mentioned, this, this goes right back to the roots of how our whole system and all of the most all of males have been brought up and, and how everything's been passed on and on. And one of the major things is you have to win. Winning is more important. And, and to win means that one person or one team has to win. And as a green, most of us know that there's a difference between win and win. We win when our candidates do well in a race, even if they don't win the race. And it's looking at even that little bit, as I said, that little tiny bit still goes all the way back. It's why they push their young children into being in sports, not because they wanna be outside and active and learn how to interact with each other, but they're on the sidelines and the dads are the ones that are getting thrown in jail for <laughs> screaming at the kids and whatever. So, yeah, it, it just it, it it's it's like a spider web. It kind of infiltrates everything. And, and we have never really taken a good look, especially inside this party, 
at just how far all the tentacles go and just how much. And I think that right now, especially since we're trying to be uh, equal in everything, and I, my being 71 years old, binary people and all of these different gender speaking things are like another language to me, but the people themselves are so amazing. And to think that you would throw them out with the trash just because you don't understand it or it's not what you were brought up with or whatever. So I think we're on the right path in this party. It's not easy, but I don't see any other party. I don't see anybody else doing this work. And even if it's only a handful of us right now, we are laying the seeds in this party. And, and I think this is something that we really need to move forward with. And I'll shut up because I can go on as people know. Thank you, Jackie. Alan, would you like to answer the question? Do I need to reread it or? Um, well, I, I can understand why people can be frustrated and disappointed with uh, what has been associated with the term feminism, but we've run into that before. Uh, we've seen words like anarchy and socialism trashed, misrepresented, or portrayed in the media in a light that does not make it palatable, and allowing someone else to define something that originally resonated with us. Well, if it originally resonated with us, we get to cling to it. We get to define it. Um, feminism is something that came along uh, over a hundred years after the insights of uh, of Marx, and said, Let, "Let's look at this from a different angle. Um, what if the polarization and oppositional nature of the sexes is at the root of uh, how society is constructed?" And that looking at that will tell us what oppression itself consists of, what power itself consists of. And the people that pursued that came back with insights. So I'm proud to embrace it as uh, something that I'm a part of and uh, participate in. And I'm not going to let anyone disappoint me out of that identity. Thank you so much, Alan. Now, I think uh, we had a, a, a kind of a running joke in our, our rehearsals where we spoke of a new term called feminarchy, <laughs> which is, you know, basically taking that patriarchal thing and, and running it you know, to the extreme to take on those behaviors. So uh, we also have some other questions um, and then I'm going to go ahead and read them. We'll do this for about six minutes. I'm just going to read all of them. Anyone can address on the panel any of these questions during the six the, minutes we have. The, the, excuse me one moment, dear. I see someone has their hand up and I don't know if we, are we going to take questions? That, in that that's answer? where I was going. And during okay, the six you. minutes, we were, we were going to maybe, um, covered some of the other questions. And then if, if some, whoever submitted them wants to just add, ask them on the mic uh, during open discussion, Kristen, are we capable of doing that? Yep, people are able to unmute themselves, yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so whoever, why don't we just do this? Does everyone uh, agree with, with maybe the people that have questions, just going ahead and asking them to save time? Do you want me to call on the people who submitted? Would sure. that be yeah, either way works too. Okay. Yeah, I got um, a thumbs up here, so let's let's go that route. Deborah, go ahead. Hi. Um, real quick, how do we support women that are divorced, homeless, uh, live in poverty, uh, struggling to survive? How do how do we support women so they can have the resources that they need to live a healthy, happy life with everything that they need to grow as a person and to become stable and independent. And to be able to do the things that they want to do in life without being restricted by fin financial constraints or maybe somebody in their life that's putting a block on them and all they do is work just to survive. How do we support 
these women that that need that so they can become strong independent um people that should be living their life purpose how, how do we do that so deborah are you asking we as a party or we in society or both we as a party and, and society Okay, that's a very good question. I will not respond to it directly because I have that experience and I could go on and on. So I'll, I'll allow the panel or any other people that, that maybe I, wanna, wanna address Deb's question, Deborah's question. I would like go ahead. To, I would like to just say a little bit on that. Um, again, when you talk about childcare and having to um, have the money for that, that's that's another thing where the importance of childcare was never ever a thing because that's not a male thing. That's not a, you know, it's the women that are the nurturers, not the males. And so it's not high on their priority. And as we can all attest, especially all the single mothers that there are in this world right now and single fathers, that this is a very, very important thing. And so I, I, I just wanted to put that part in there, that connection to, again, another one of the tentacles. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on a panel? Uh, I do have a response. Um, forgive me, uh, I don't have any statistics on me, but you mentioned a few things about how to help women throughout all areas of their lives, especially those who are marginalized. And I would say that, um, for those who are uh, marginalized in the sense of class, meaning they're homeless or whatever, I would say that hygiene is probably one of the biggest things necessary just to make sure that um, they themselves can have a healthy immune system and be able to uh, take care of their personal needs. I think that's essential. I think that um, protection and support for trauma um, making sure that especially unhoused women don't rely on abusers um, or drug sellers to say that um, for support, at least that's what I've seen in the homeless community that I've worked in, that that's a major issue. Now, I also think that getting access for those who have the ability um, to be able to form small businesses and workers cooperatives. Um, there are many um, pro-women workers cooperatives that I've seen throughout the entire country that give women who are especially facing domestic abuse, who have children, access to work. And I think that can help um, self-reliance and independence. Now, briefly, if they're stuck with their abuser, that's a, a completely different situation. And it's really important to seek professional help because you don't know how far that abuser will go and to what extent they will endanger the woman in question or uh, their child. I think um, in that case, uh, definitely working towards workplace protections if this woman is working all the time to make sure that if a domestic abuser comes to their place of work, uh, that people are there to protect them. I think medical confidentiality is very essential too. Um, and I would definitely uh, suggest working with a Planned Parenthood in your neighborhood regarding that. But I don't want to dominate time, so I'll let other people. Anyone else on the panel? Um, in 1970, uh, Carol Hanisch pointed out that the personal is political. I think a lot of times our political organizations, uh, our local Green Party are not being immune to this tends to define the political in terms of, uh, you know, the United States needs to stop being an oppressor nation and we need to get organized on that. Or uh, we have massive wealth inequality throughout the United States and we need to get organized on that. Um, and these are certain valid, certainly valid concerns, but uh, we perhaps need to also uh, look at the people who are actually showing up at the meetings and make sure that we're prepared to organize at a level of, uh, can we provide listings of uh, um, 
of buildings that are appropriate for people to perhaps split the rent on as a way of living more cheaply and to pool resources um, to make available to each other the things that uh, that we have so that they don't have to go out and each person buy an individual copy thereof, anything ranging from lawn mowers to uh, old used cars. Um, we need to avoid unconsciously structuring what our local Green Party is in such a way that it's a good home for people that can, can climb into their convenient SUV and drive back to their convenient suburb sold, but becomes a place that's off-putting to someone who doesn't have those resources. We're not going to bring in the people um, who don't have the conveniences that some of us do have if we don't make the Green Party something that's politically addressing this situation. Thank you, Ellen. And piggybacking off of Ellen and Aiden's comments, um, I will disclose that my daughter and I were homeless four times as I was bringing her up. Um, I had an extremely abusive um, ex who kept us in court for over 10 years trying to get take her away from me. And during that time, you know, I was I struggled with health issues, mental health. Um, and just trying to survive, make ends meet while all, all you know the stress of having been in a foster home myself and being in a position to where someone's trying to take my own child from me. I can tell you that in Minnesota, there are a number of really good resources that helped us make it. We had shelters to go to when we needed to. Um, there were good programs in place at the shelters that helped us to be able to um, find housing um, support me with finding work and uh, ensured that we were fed. We had everything we needed physically um, as far as hygiene products, clothing and things like that. So one of the things that's, that's a passion for me is women and children, um, not to the exclusion of any other demographic, but because like I said, we all approach from based on our interests. And so I, you know, one of the things I, I would really like to see happen with our party um, I know Kenneth Mejia did a lot of uh, feeding the homeless on Skid Row, and there were a lot of videos of that. But I'd like to see us do more as an organization towards, you know, helping people that are struggling out there from all demographics. Um, when it comes to women and children, and other, you know, at risk youth in, in the lavender community, and things like that, we need like to really. I think what would really help us as a party is to actually have things in place where people can go that they aren't indoctrinated into a certain faith to have to, to get safety and, and harbor from the streets. They, they don't have to be prayed over every day, but just maybe found some, some shelters ourselves based on our, ticket, ten, our ten, four pillars and 10 key values so that you know people can understand what we are about, both not just in speech, but in actual practice. Over. Laura, did you have a? Yeah, uh, just, uh quick thing about I've spent some time um, as a Latin American solidarity activist and in countries that have very bad reputation with the U.S. media and government like Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua where our country has even levied sanctions against them. But, but one of the things that we as a Green Party organization could do is be more tolerant of having children in meetings, you know, there you see that people, women are much, are, you see very empowered women and you see meetings where, um, I mean, I would have to open up my own toleration of having those little creatures running around, you know, like my daughter when she was young making all sorts of noise and interruption, but it is partly a patriarchal value to have things so, um, quiet, uh, you know, so that one person is speaking and, you know, all uh, and, and uh, against any anarchy, which children certainly represent. Um, and so that's the one thing that I would say is that th we could make it more friendly to have children accompany their parents. Over. Thank you, Laura. That's a very, very powerful point. Uh, so we have a 15 minute warning for everyone. Um, does anyone have any other comments, suggestions, or questions that they'd like to present before 
we are before we conclude. We do have quite a few other questions come in. I'm just going to read them all off, and then um, you guys can respond as you'd like to. Um, so we have question. The third question: Could you share some of the party's recent and or notable feminist victories? Next question, can you talk a bit about the influence of religious groups in perpetuating patriarchy? Next question, if there's something we need to, something we need to look at is the internal party. Uh, many state committees, even Boston, has a manner to patronize women, even members who are leaders. How can we stop this patriarchism in our own state committees? Um, next question, has the Green Party ever gotten endorsements from local or national women's rights or feminist groups? If not, what do you think are the challenges in getting such backing? And last question, um, women also care for mothers and mother-in-laws. Oh, nope, that's the comment, not a question. All right, that's it. <laughs> um, and I just want to say I had the religious question and I was looking at the title of the workshop and it's kind of off topic so I'm going to just withdraw that I found that last question sorry um does anyone have any comments on what's happening with the England and Wales Green Party this week with Sean Barry and how do we handle the discussion locally all right and those were all the questions okay so what in I mean, we can just open discuss if someone has a particular uh, perspective on any of the topics that are the questions that were asked. I know I have quite a few. I like the religious groups and, and patriarchy as a Buddhist, Nietzsche and Buddhist, SGI, and uh, the men in the state committees. Uh, yeah. So what was the original question that that was asked, Kristen? The very, very first one. I, I took notes on all of them, but. Sure, the first one was, could you share some of the party's recent and or notable feminist victories? And then Aiden, I think you had asked, can you talk a bit about the influence of religious groups in perpetuating patriarchy? Um, any of the panelists, if you wanna um, send me a message in the chat if you need others repeated. Okay. Well, this is Laura, and I'll, I'll say something about the, it was a feminist victory way back when, when um, we actually had a value. One of the 10 key values was called post-patriarchal values, which is not bad really, but um, people wanted to say feminism straight out. Uh, and there was a big, uh, a lot of resistance to that. They're saying, oh, okay, yeah, sure, we all believe in feminism. So it's similar to what's happening with eco socialism right now. We all believe in, you know, in that, in feminism, but it will turn other people off, you know, who are coming in because of environmental and stuff like that. And we don't want to turn other people off. So it was actually a victory to get it out, to, to get it there um, explicitly. And another thing, a state party, I, I, in California, we've had our share of patriarchy, um, well-known patriarchs, I believe, across the country. And one of the ways that having a woman's caucus, having a group of women, you know, like a few women get together and talk about, okay, what's coming up next and how are we going to deal with it and have solidarity among whatever group it is, you know, but for, uh, it really helps. And that helps to, uh, to make sure that somebody's going to put out the ideas, somebody's going to speak and, and other people will speak up in support of it um, and things like that. So a, a local women's caucus for the state um, committees, I think would help over. Okay, does anyone have any other comments, questions, or suggestions? Do they wanna address the questions that were asked or? I'll quickly address um, the question on religion. Um, this is interesting to me because uh, when I think about the historical construct of how 
religion has played a role in patriarchal values is the interpretation of a Bible quote, which says, God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals on earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So what we do know is that because of this quote taken throughout the Catholic Church and the Inquisitions, they believe that their dominion over the earth could uh, be a God-given right, essentially. Whereas many other people could see this quote and say, we need environmental stewardship. We should approach the world in the form of Adam, giving names to beings and understanding their character. But through this, we see the, um, the state and the church being universally controlled by the same people, um, which led to scientific racism. And of course, I'm using the European construct, um, but scientific racism was very much based off of dominion of the earth. And even Darwinism, that theory of biological evolution, um, that was also a form of dominion over the earth, even though Darwin uh, gave this scientific principle, it was religious in nature. Um, natural selection had led to creationism in which individuals can compete and survive and reproduce according to their nature. So how does religion influence patriarchy? Well, religion in its um, simplistic aspects underscores the role of men over women, Adam over Eve, humans over the earth, and it reduces these to these generalized generalized principles that have no complexity. And it's important to remember historically, not everyone had access to reading, not everyone had access to the actual text and their interpretations based off of other people. But I also wanna mention in Islam, um, it's important to recognize that both men and women are treated equally within the sights of Allah or God. Um, it's important to recognize that um, there are equal attributes to whatever happens during a divorce. Uh, if a family member passes, women are allowed to own property, women are allowed to be given uh, fairness under a legal system. And the same is true in many indigenous cultures as well. So this Western idea of dominion does have um, its uh, effects over society. And because of globalization, those same effects have been produced throughout the rest of the world. But I would say this isn't a natural case for humanity, but rather the simplistic notion and the general biases of those who are in power passed down to the rest of us. Thank you, Aiden. And uh, I have my own theories on the role of patriarchy and, and religion. I, I don't want to take a risk on, on offending anyone who may have a different faith. I can say that the reason I joined and have been a member of Sokagakai International, which means Value Creation Society in Japanese, it's uh, a newer form of Buddhism, is because the original uh, monk that kind of started the movement was the first one to come along, even in, in ancient times in the 13th century Japan, and say, all, all you know, women, children, everyone can achieve enlightenment in this lifetime. And that, that was a new concept. Um, there was no division of the sexes. We don't have priests and nuns, et cetera. But, and this is why this particular faith appealed to me. Uh, we, I believe we have about six minutes. Does anyone else have a contribution or a perspective or insight into this discussion? Sorry, we don't have time to answer every question in depth. Okay, so hearing uh, no other questions, I will go ahead and thank everyone for attending today and attending our workshop. I love you greens, much love, and we will see you around. Take care. Thank you.